New astronomers, Michael here, and thank you for tuning into my channel. And in this episode, I will tell you why beginners should not buy their first telescope based on magnification alone, and which telescopes I do recommend for beginners. Coming right up. And if you're new to my channel, I create product reviews, first impressions, instructional videos, and vlogging in general about astronomy. So if you'd like to follow along, please hit that subscribe button. If you're in the market for a new telescope, you might have seen telescopes such as these. Magnification claims on telescope packaging is a marketing ploy to get novices to buy the most powerful telescope at a ridiculously low price. A telescope's magnification is just one of many properties that contribute to how well a telescope will perform, such as its aperture, its objective lens, its focal length, eyepieces, build quality, its weight, its mount and accessories, and its price. So why is there this obsession over a telescope's magnification power? It's because these marketing executives want new astronomers to think they'll be able to see these beautiful images of planets and galaxies through their telescopes. These images were taken using astrophotography equipment and further enhanced using specialized software. In reality, galaxies and nebulas will appear as dim gray smudges in your telescope. And the greater the magnification, the dimmer these objects become. But why is that? Let me explain. When resolving objects through your telescope, one of the most important properties is its aperture, or the size of the objective lens, or in this case, the primary mirror. This dictates the telescope's ability to collect light and determines the maximum resolution of the objects. You cannot increase the resolution of the image beyond the aperture's ability. For example, if you had the following object in the field of view and you magnify it two times, it will look like this. When you magnify, not only do you increase the size of the image, you also increase the size of the blurriness that comes with that. And there is nothing that the focuser can do to improve that. The level of detail is stuck, unless you're in an episode of CSI where you can zoom in and enhance to your heart's content. Bring his face up. His glasses. There's a reflection. You may have a witness. Using higher magnification also results in dimmer objects. This is because the amount of light does not increase with higher power. It remains the same. And when you zoom in, the light is spread further apart, resulting in lower brightness. This is especially bad if you're trying to resolve deep space objects like galaxies because they're already faint objects to begin with. Another thing that higher magnification amplifies is motion and shakiness. Take this example of Saturn. As the Earth rotates, it will slowly drift out of the field of view. Under higher magnification, it drifts away even faster, so you would need to adjust your field of view more frequently. Your mount's stability or instability also plays a role. Whenever you readjust your field of view, there's going to be a little bit of shaking, which takes about a couple of seconds to stop. But under higher magnification, this shaking is more apparent and detectable in the eyepiece. So in that respect, it's a little bit more inconvenient to use higher magnification because you'd have to wait a little bit longer whenever you readjust your field of view. Higher magnification also makes it more difficult to find objects, especially if you're just a beginner. Using high magnification, it's easy to get lost in the sea of stars if you're too far zoomed in. To find an object in the sky, you typically need to be zoomed out by first starting with a lower powered eyepiece. This allows you to see your orientation 
in the major points of reference like constellations. Then you can center the object you're interested in observing in the field of view. And then you can replace the eyepiece with a higher powered one. Now you're at least in the neighborhood of the object you want to observe. But what if you already have that cheap telescope with an unbelievable magnification? Don't sweat it. I did the same thing when I bought my first telescope. I can think of at least two things that could happen. Number one, you became so disappointed so badly that you've lost interest in astronomy and you never ever want to stargaze again. Or number two, you became so unimpressed by that first telescope that you want to upgrade. And I hope it's the latter. I like to say that sometimes we win, sometimes we learn. And I like looking at it as a learning experience. That way, you know when you have a good telescope in your hands the next time. Having said all that, which telescopes do I recommend for beginners? If I was a beginner astronomer all over again, I would go for a telescope such as the Celestron Astromaster 70. It is a good first telescope that will pique my interest in astronomy. This is a refractor telescope with a fully coated 70 mm objective lens with a focal length of 900 mm. It comes with two eyepieces with different magnification. This is a telescope that allows a beginner to have a good view of the planets and the moon. It uses an altazimuth mount, which is more intuitive to use for a beginner. The quality of the optics are also pretty good for its price. It's also lightweight and easy to set up, so there's little excuse not to go out for a night of observation. My next recommendation is this Celestron Astromaster 130. This is a reflector telescope which has a 130 millimeter primary mirror. There are a couple of things that I like about this telescope. The first one is that the aperture is large enough for beginners to actually resolve deep space objects such as the Andromeda Galaxy and the Orion Nebula. And the second thing is that it uses an equatorial mount which is easier to use for beginners because it allows you to track objects using a knob. There are other comparable telescopes that are also good for beginners, such as the Orion Observer 70, the Celestron Power Seeker 127, the Orion Space Probe 130, and the Skywatcher Classic 150 Dobsonian. That last one might be a tad too big for a beginner, but the Dobsonian mount makes up for it because it's easy to use, it's intuitive, just like an Altazimuth mount. Sometimes all you really need is a good pair of binoculars, like the Celestron Skymaster 25 by 70 binoculars. Now these are different. This is a Nikon Action 8 by 40. Sometimes I show up at my astronomy club's dark sky site with nothing more than these. And in fact, the first time I resolved the Andromeda Galaxy was with these in my backyard, and that was enough to inspire me to buy a telescope. They're very portable and require no extra equipment to set up. They may have low magnification, but they can resolve stars and constellations quite nicely. And sometimes a good pair of binoculars is better than a cheap telescope. So in closing, magnification is just one of many factors that you need to consider when buying your first telescope. If you want to try before you buy, your local astronomy club may already have telescopes that you can take home for a few days. Or maybe they have a stationary one that you can reserve. If you're a part of an astronomy club, call them and find out if they have any telescopes available for you to borrow, buy, or trade for. And if you're not in an astronomy club, I highly recommend that you join one. And that'll be all for this episode of New Astronomer. If you like this video, please hit that like button, or better yet, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next episode. And as always, clear skies, and thank you for watching.